Yes, it is true that throughout our evolution, we have had a lot of toxins to deal with. But the problem is that there are so many new poisons created that didn't exist before that we haven't had an ability to adapt to yet if you've done the juice cleanse or a fast and felt great afterwards great now why is it not always a good idea then when you're reducing your foods to nothing you're also reducing not just the poisons that are coming in but also the nutrients that are coming in everyone does this the wrong way around they start with activities whether it's fasting or exercise or whatever that remove toxins from storage when the processing centers are probably already overloaded and the exits are probably already overloaded and or blocked. So I recommend. Welcome to the Rejuvenate podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, the creator and founder of Genetic Insights and Feel Younger, Elwin Robinson. And today we are discussing detoxification, what it is, what it isn't, and how to do it safely and effectively. So tell me, Elwin, why did you want to discuss detoxification today? Well, it occurred to me we'd already done an episode on uh, the liver, and that was, I would say, cutting-edge information uh, that most people don't know about the liver's crucial role in detox, which I think people do know, but as to how to improve that significantly in a way I think most people don't know. And I'll reference that episode, and I won't repeat the contents of it again in this episode because it was over two hours, but... There is, of course, a lot more to detoxification only than supporting the liver. And I realize that that's something we hadn't covered yet. And it's super, super important. We just filmed our uh, episodes recently, a couple of weeks ago, on the Rejuvenation Blueprint. And I talk about how it's step three of that. And it's a very, very important step. Um, as I talk about in those episodes, often, although it's not the place that I recommend people start in many cases, the root cause of whatever issues are bothering them often is either uh, toxins or it's chronic infections or it's a combination of the two. And so, yeah, in this episode, I wanted to thoroughly explore it as well as debunk a lot of the myths about detoxification, like the ideas that, you know, a detox is something that you can do in a weekend or whatever. So, uh, but it won't just be uh, myth debunking. I want to also give people a framework to understand it so that then um, they can do things in the right order. Most of what goes wrong with people attempting to detox that I have seen and also experienced for myself is attempting to do things in the wrong order. And unfortunately, but I guess you could say typically, the way that we're often taught to detoxify is exactly the wrong way to do it if we want to feel good, which is you know very, very important because if we associate detoxification with feeling bad, we're not going to want to do it long term. Actually, detoxification uh, is not a case of no pain, no gain. It's a case of the less toxins you have in your system, the better you feel. But we want to kind of minimize at least any difficulty or suffering that is involved in the process of getting them out. Really good point. And yes, we did go into a lot of depth in that um, episode on detoxification, specifically around the liver. And that was very eye-opening, which also helped me discover like, oh, okay, why some people might feel so rubbish if that liver really isn't functioning well. So I'm really happy to get into this and and learn more about the full process of it. Because you do hear out there so many different types and things like that and wondering, you know, are people doing it correctly? So I'm glad we're going to really unpack it today. So first off, let's let's really, you know, figure out what is detoxification? Yeah, good question. Well, I suppose to answer that, we'll just very quickly review what is a toxin, right? Because if you talk to some people about this, very mainstream people, medical people, um, you know, they do say that it's kind of, the, the very concept of detoxification is nonsense. We'll get into that for a second. But I think one of the things that they don't even like is this definition of like the people aren't really clear about what a toxin means. And I think they've actually got a fairly good point. I think a lot of the mainstream criticism of detoxification in general is actually quite valid. So I don't have the usual perspective of just like battling against that. But I want to say well, it's valid, but still missing something. Um, so what is a toxin? A toxin is a poison. And as, uh, you know, the famous quote from Paracelsus says, the difference between medicine and poison is often dosage. So when we say detoxification, we mean reducing and or removing poisons. That's really it. That's what we're talking about. Um, and this could be reducing poisons going in. And so when people talk about, you know, 
not drinking alcohol for a month, sober October, that kind of uh, social um, media, uh, you know, thing. Or when people talk about doing a cleanse where they're only having juices or people talk about fasting, where people talk about, you know, going gluten free for 10 days, all that kind of thing. Although it will have some impact on the other side of the equation, what they're really focusing on there is usually temporarily, for some reason, reducing the toxins or really poisons going in to the body. And when I say for some reason, I mean, I understand the rationale behind it. It's to give the body a chance to uh, give it a break and give it a chance to catch up on the backlog of poison that is existing in the body. That's the idea behind it. And of course, there is some validity to that. Absolutely. That's what we're talking about. That's what detoxification is. It is just removing poison. So it could be removing poisons going in, but it could also be encouraging and supporting the body in removing poisons. That's the other side of the uh, equation. There is perhaps a third element that could be talked about, which is supporting the body and creating less of its own poisons. But that gets pretty complex, and we might get into that in another episode because it involves you know, quite a bit of biochemistry. And honestly, from a practical point of view, you don't really usually need to focus on that. All you need to do is focus on the combination of reducing the amount coming in and increasing the amount going out. It's really as simple as that. Perfect. So really focusing on, you know, what are, what is the toxin? And as you just, you know, said, reducing it and getting it, getting as much to leave as possible. As you were just saying earlier about, you know, some things are temporary or people are stopping it for a period of time. You know, really, shouldn't the body be able to deal with getting these things out on its own without us having to do detoxes or cleanses? Yeah, and that is the most uh, common objection to the very concept of detoxification or cleansing that I hear from a mainstream medical perspective. And I would say it's possibly the f most foolish one for a couple of reasons. So, first of all, because everyone is different, right? So, people have very different sized livers kidneys, uh, uh, stomachs, but let's, let's focus on uh, liver and kidney as the two big uh, toxin processing organs in the body. So, and when I say size, I mean, literally you autopsy, you cut it out, put it on the scale, how much does it weigh, right? Uh, they can be two, three, four, depending on the organ times the size from the smallest to the biggest. Okay. So if the, even the size can vary that much, do we not think there's a possibility that the effectiveness and the function could vary that much, or in fact more. Meaning, the person with the least effective liver or the least effective kidneys could have like a double, triple, quadruple, maybe 10 times less effective liver than the person with the most effective liver or kidneys. And of course, um, if we think of this anecdotally, we all know this is true. We all know that there are some people who seem to be able to get away with murder or whatever, you know, who can drink and do drugs all night, barely getting to sleep, wake up in the morning feeling great. Other people, you know, they have a tiny bit of sugar or, you know, gluten or whatever, and they, they feel decimated. And so now, you know, in the case of, I guess, sugar and gluten, there may be something else going on with the immune system, but that's related to the detoxification system. But let's say alcohol, right? Someone like can have a sip, sip of alcohol, they wake up the next morning with a terrible hangover. So we all know that there is that large variation. And this is one of the problems with the medical approach to me is that it's very unscientific because it treats everyone as if they're the same. Think about when they're giving out medications. I mean, sometimes they'll base it on the weight of the person, uh, and that's the most they'll do. But mostly it's like, you know, take two first thing in the morning and they, they give the same dose to the person if they're a hundred pound or if they're 300 pounds. How does that make any sense? You know? So that's the most obvious way that that's a foolish thing to say, because there's so much individual variation. Now, I think we're going to do a part two or depending on how long this goes, we might do it at the end of this episode where we go through your and I DNA, um, in relation to detoxification as well, Chrissy. And uh, and we'll see. There will be certain areas of detoxification that you're better at and not so good at. There'll be certain areas of detoxification that I will be better at and not good at. One of the ones I've talked many times before because it's been such a defining thing in my life is my body's not good at detoxifying lead, which is why it's still very high in my system right now. It unfortunately, it takes a very long time to get rid of. We'll talk about that later. So there are these variations specifically, but then there's also general variations. 
you know, one of the reports uh, that we do at Genetic Insights is how good you are at detoxification in general. And there are some people who are blessed to be good in general and some people who find it more difficult in general. So the idea that everyone should be able to deal with toxins at least equally well is ludicrous and, you know, easily falsifiable that that's not actually the case. And yet that is the position that they, uh, that they tend to take. So the other aspect of it, and this is the one that's a bit more controversial from a mainstream point of view, but I'll still say it because I think it's 100% true. Yes, it is true that throughout our evolution, we have had a lot of toxins to deal with. I'll give you an example. Um, until like the modern heating systems were created, which is relatively recent and still in some parts of the world, this is still a huge issue. Um, we were br a lot of us had smoke indoors. We were having fires indoors. The ventilation system wasn't very sophisticated and we were breathing a lot of smoke. A lot of people, a lot of our ancestors died from smoke inhalation. It was like a major, major issue. Your choices were either freeze to death now or poison yourself with smoke. So, you know, and uh, our ability to store food correctly has, you know, correctly, our ability to store food well <laughs> has only really been the case again for a few decades. So throughout most of history, you know, sometimes we had to eat food that was old, that was already had mold growing on it, that, you know, whatever, it was already rotten to some degree, um, or there was the risk that it might be, and we just had to take that chance because there wasn't any other food. So those are just a couple of examples. But yes, throughout our evolution, it's true that our ancestors had to cope with and adapt to a significant amount of toxicity. And in a way, it is true to say that we have less of that obvious toxicity than ever before. But the problem is that there are so many new poisons created that didn't exist before. Exactly, like Since, our plastics and things like that. Exactly, yeah, that's a great example. And all the drugs which we're either taking voluntarily or you know, end up in the water, yeah. or, or they're in the water supply that we're drinking unfiltered, or they're given to animals that we're then eating. So all of the chemicals that are created, all the drugs that are created, as you say, plastics are a great example, the, the xenoestrogens. It's not necessarily that they are more toxic, toxic than what our ancestor had to deal with 200 years ago, although you could easily make an argument that they are, but that might be hard to quantify. But the point is it's new. Like s inhaling smoke from wood is something that, although it still kills people and still did kill a lot of people, we had thousands, hundreds of thousands, whatever of years of adapting to that. So it's less poisonous to us than it could be because we adapted to it to some degree. Uh, evolution, unfortunately, happens quite slowly. So the problem is really that we have all these toxins now that have been recently created through the miracle of chemistry and uh, pharmacopoeia that we haven't had an ability to adapt to yet. And I would also say the toxic load. You know, there's there's a lot more today than ever before. It's it's exponentially increasing as well. So that must put a bigger point or you know area on our body for not being able to handle it either. Well, like I said, the toxic load could be argued. Could be argued that. 200 years ago, uh, we had a big toxic load from, you know, the smoke in the air and the, the uh, dirt in the water we were forced to drink and the dirt in the food we were forced to eat and all the rest. So well, I'm not saying you're wrong, Chrissy. You're probably right. But the point is, from a mainstream point of view, it's more arguable. Right. But what can't be argued is the amount of new toxins. No, very so true. it's the new load that's the, uh, the thing that really is irrefutable, even though they'll still refute it. Now, today, I mean... You see it. You see it so in so many places. Cleanses, detox, this, that. Firstly, are cleanses and detoxes the same thing? And also, with there being so many different types out there, you know, it's hard for people to probably to figure out. I know it would be for me. You know, is you know juice cleanses are those a good idea? Is fasting a good idea? You know, what are your thoughts on that? So the difference between a cleanse and a detox, I would say, is uh, they're both kind of buzzwords or marketing words, so it really depends on how they're being used. I don't believe that there is any fundamental distinction between the two, no. Um, maybe the 
in theory, the focus of the word detox might be more reducing the toxins coming in and the focus of the word cleanse might be more on helping the toxins go out. Um, but I think in a practical sense, it's not really used that way. It's just, they're kind of just used uh, interchangeably. Um, yeah, so different types of cleanses and detoxes and juice, juice uh, fasts and fasting and all that kind of stuff is um, potentially helpful and yet also potentially problematic. And I think to fully explain why, we'll have to go into really understanding detoxification. But yeah, I'll just touch upon it. So if you've done one of those, if you've done a juice cleanse or a fast and felt great afterwards, felt great during, great, good for you. Obviously, on a simple logical level, if you just reduce the amount of poison going in, even if it's temporary, even if it's only a weekend or five days or 10 days or whatever it might be, that could be, in theory, it should be, except for the exceptions I'm going to go through, a really good thing, right? It gives your body a break. It gives the liver and the kidneys and all the rest of the system, which I'm going to list in a minute, a break. Um at least reduces the toxins coming in. Now, why is it not always a good idea then? Why should people not just do them as often as possible, Uh, whether we're talking about fasting or juice cleanses or whatever? So there's a few different reasons. What do fasting and juice cleanses have in common, first of all? Well, they're obviously reducing the... They're attempting, at least, to reduce the intake of poisons, right? So people, the average person is taking in all kinds of poisons on an everyday basis through all kinds of means. In fact, maybe we should go through and list those, right? So there's a few different ways you can take in poisons. You can take in poisons through the air you breathe. I would say this is the most um, ignored and not focused on area. You can take in poisons through the pores of your skin. Um, This is was ignored when I first started teaching this stuff, but I think people are starting to become more and more aware of this now, certainly more than they are like about air quality. You can take in poisons through the liquids that you drink. You can take in poisons through uh, food and other things that you swallow. So, you know, food, pills, whatever. Um, those are really the main ways that poisons are coming into your system, right? And we'll talk about how they get out in a bit. That's a, that's a whole other conversation. So, if you are juice cleansing, doesn't really affect any. Uh, if you do juice uh, juice cleansing or fasting, it doesn't really affect any of the poisons that you're breathing in. Doesn't really affect any of the poisons that you're getting in coming through the skin. Um, but it definitely reduces the other two, right? And I believe that there's an evolutionary reason why we tend to focus on what we consume, because uh, as opposed to say what we're breathing in or what we're having in going through the skin. Because I think throughout most of history, um, and you can see this in animals in general, animals in nature anyway, in the wild, are generally obsessed with food. So predators are obsessed with food because predators are pretty much, as we understand, constantly hungry. Uh, whenever your food is able to run away or fight back, it means that <laughs> it's a you, lot tend of work to to <laughs> <laughs> you tend to be running on a deficit. Uh, you know, I think we glamorize predators. I notice even vegans who really dislike uh you know hurting anim- any animal or whatever they glamorize predators more than uh than herbivores for some reason um and you know certainly most people do but we have to understand that while they you know cats and dogs may be amazing and beautiful and all the rest of it and i love them too um if it, if you're out in the wild and you are uh, you know largely dependent on killing something else in order to eat that's going to be your focus a lot of the time. Herbivores um, don't have the same scarcity, but a lot of them are eating most of the day. You know, you see your cow, your sheep, your your whatever. um, They're pretty much, (laughs) uh, yeah, pretty much eating is the number one activity. So one way or another, it is very, whether you consider us, you know, originally to be herbivores or all kind of ores, and we've talked about this in a previous episode, how we're kind of both, depending on the time period of our revolution, uh, we're obsessed with food. And as well as being obsessed with getting food, another obsession, which is, I would say, um, you know, more human-centric, but other primates certainly have it in mammals, is making sure the food isn't poisonous. It's like a big preoccupation. I say more the, you know, the mammals and stuff because the lower life forms, they just eat the same thing and that's they're kind of 
they eat what they're pre-programmed, but mammals are more like, oh, what's this? You know, maybe I'll try it kind of thing. So um, there's a preoccupation, first of all, getting enough, but second of all, is it dangerous? Is it poisonous? Is it going to kill me? And so I think because that was so important for our evolution and the ancestors who survived will be the ones who are most likely to focus on those questions rather than go, ah, it would probably be all right, you know? So <laughs> therefore, um, we, you know, we have selected for those who are cautious and f obsessed with food, basically. And so it's very natural that that's what we would do. But actually, focusing only on what we're eating and drinking is only part of the story. But anyway, if we leave that aside for a second, if we are fasting we are definitely going to be eating and drinking. Well, we're definitely going to be eating less poison. Why? Because we're not eating anything. Right. <laughs> so by definition, or every poison that we normally eat, we wouldn't eat. Now, if you're still drinking tap water or whatever, then actually you're still getting a decent amount of poisons coming in, but it's still going to be less, right? Now, with a juice cleanse, it really depends on the juice, you know? So, you know, obvious thing that not many people in our community would argue with is if it's not organic, it may well be full of pesticides, right? That's not very anti-poison necessarily, right? Um, if you're more in, you know, the uh, carnivore or carnivore adjacent community, you may actually be aware that all of these plants actually contain uh, defense chemicals because they don't actually want to be eaten. So... You could argue that you're taking in less poisons, but maybe not that much less if you're having liters and liters of juice. Because, again, unless it's all fruit juice, fruit admittedly is lower in uh, poisons. Uh, although, if you can't handle sugar, then that will act as if it's a poison in you. If you can't handle fructose very well, and a lot of people can't who have uh, a backlog of toxicity because their liver is struggling and your liver is acquired in order to process fructose. And if you have a chronic infection like candida, then that could be a reason why you can't handle fructose very well. But anyway, in theory, at least, it's possible that fruit would be pretty low in uh, poisons. But certainly if it's like vegetable juices, those are, you know, maybe they've got oxalates, uh, salicylates, lectins, all kinds of other things in uh, even, you know, polyphenols and all the rest of it. They're supposed to be good for you, but they are still poisons, um, <clears throat> even if they're kind of good for you in some ways. So you're kind of maybe reducing the amount of poisons that you've got but coming in. there's no way to know for sure. It's very difficult to judge because it depends what your body struggles with, you know? So someone who's used to eating, let's say, a diet of purely, uh, you know, potato and meat, you know, a very, what's the word, traditionally mainstream, um, you know, wealthy person diet, I guess, that they would actually be having more plant chemicals coming in if they suddenly start having, you know, juices with spinach and broccoli and kale and, you know, beetroot and all this kind of stuff. Not saying that's necessarily wrong, but, you know, there is also poison in potato, I understand, solanine and et cetera. But I'm just saying, if you're adapted to a certain kind of poison and suddenly you have a different kind of poison, that may not actually be the best thing for you. It's not as black and white as the people pushing these things make it seem anyway. Uh, we can certainly say that. And but So that's kind of the, the details of why a cleanse uh, and, or, and a fast may not be as detoxing as you think. But still, if it means that, you know, if you're the kind of person who eats uh, fast food every day, if you're the kind of person who, you know, drinks large amounts of alcohol every day, smokes every day, all the rest, you cut all that out and you're just drinking fruit juices or vegetable juices, sure, you are probably better off. I'm not trying to be difficult, right? Now, here's the other challenge. The other challenge is that the way that the body works is when you reduce the process, uh, when you reduce the amount of toxins coming in, let's say you are actually succeeding in that goal, your body will then often, um, and especially if you're also significantly reducing your calories, sorry, let's just clarify that as well, as you tend to be certainly with, you know, uh, fast, I'd say really definitely also with, you know, most juice cleanses, unless they're unless you're really having a hell of a lot of fruit juice. Um, and even then it's only carbs, you know, very little protein and usually no fat. So when that happens, 
your body will often go into a cleansing mode. And this is where the people teaching this stuff, I would say, are partly accurate when they say, if you feel worse, it's not um, part of the reason why you feel worse is because your body is taking the opportunity to start to um, release some toxicity from storage. Now, that has to be explained properly because... There's, there's, there are many other reasons why you might feel bad on a cleanse and a fast, all right? So let me just get that out of, the, out of the way first. First of all, what you're having on a cleanse may not be as free of poisons as you think, right? Your water might still be full of poisons. Your skin might still be getting loads of poisons. Your air might still be uh, poisons. If you're having any kind of juices or anything, they may still be full of poisons. If you're having any kind of supplement, they may still be full of poisons, um, so, you know, that's one factor. It, it, there may not be as much of a reduction as you think. I think that it, to some degree, when I was doing the juice fasting, all the rest of it, I was making things worse just because I was taking in like massive amounts of, uh, uh, carotenoids, for instance, which as we talked about in a previous episode is not necessarily a great thing. And generally people want to cleanse. They are having a lot of that. I never did like a pure fruit juice fast, but that would largely avoid that particular issue. Um, so that's one uh, particular uh, uh, aspect of it. Now, the other thing is when you're reducing um, your foods to nothing or maybe just having liquids, you're also reducing not just the poisons that are coming in, but also the nutrients that are coming in. <laughs> Those building blocks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Building blocks for the body to function in general, and then also building blocks for the detoxification process specifically. So uh, one of the most important things for supporting the body in detoxification is various amino acids. Uh, most cleanses are low protein. So that can be a problem straight away. Um, also, your body uses fats to store toxins, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So if you're suddenly removing all the fats coming in, this often starts a process of uh, release and robs your body of a potential resource to contain the toxicity, I guess that right, would yeah. be the... Because it was in storage previously, and now it's kind of like, oh, like going to that cupboard where you've shoved everything in and you don't have to deal with it. But when you open up those doors, you're like, ah shoot, there it is. Got to deal with it. And you're not trying to open up those right. doors, right? All you're trying it's, to do is take less in out. <laughs> for a weekend or five days or whatever the thing says. But absolutely, you know, you're like, oh God, all that is starting to come. Um, so yeah, the lack of nutrients is concerning. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality, affordable supplements that Elwin and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers, but the prices are very affordable. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're really helpful and friendly. And what I love most of all is the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it. I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have from most articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code rejuvenateme for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code rejuvenateme at feelyounger.net. And then another thing that's concerning when it comes to cleanses and fasts specifically, as opposed to just, I'm not going to drink for a month or whatever, that doesn't have this problem. But if we're talking about juices, uh, juice fasts and, uh, de uh, and fasts, we're reducing calories significantly, as we said, reducing protein and fat. And what's that going to do? That is very, very likely to slow down the metabolism. It's going to reduce thyroid function which goes along with slowing the metabolism. It's what slows the metabolism. So when you eat less, when you take in less calories, when you, t when you are, uh, eat, even if you're, let's say, having a lot of fruit juice, but you're having, you know, completely devoid of amino acids, um, your body is going to be uh, more depleted and it's going to assume that there is some kind of starvation system going on. So we talked about metabolism a lot before. Metabolism is basically the speed at which the mitochondria in your cells create energy. That's the simple way of looking at it. And the kind of telltale um, 
a sign of it is the warmth that you feel on your body on an experiential level and because that sometimes can be deceiving you know the warmth that you have like a basal metabolism as a human being you want to be about 37 or 98.6 depending on what you're using to measure if you're using centigrade or fahrenheit so if you are reducing the um calories to the point that the body thinks oh there's not enough food then the 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 reason why your body is able to slow metabolism even though it means that every cell of your body has less energy available to it and it's not a good thing is because as i said a few minutes ago throughout most of evolution abundant food has not been guaranteed so the slower your metabolism is yes the less energy your cells are creating but the more that they're kind of making do with what they have more efficiently so by slowing the metabolism it's less energy but more efficient use of the you know the smaller level resources that you have so it's going to slow your metabolism when you fast definitely when you juice fast almost definitely and so when your metabolism is less fast well metabolism controls every system of your body including the detoxification system so it then means that the detoxification system also works more slowly and when i say detoxification i specifically mean the elements of processing and removing um and i think yeah i think i'll explain that next so there are basically three phases to the detoxification processes there is um first of all toxins are to some degree they're also they're coming in all the time obviously for all the roots that i said but there is also a bunch of them in storage right then they may so they may be coming in or they may be in storage then there may be uh maybe they're released from storage so there's a few different things that can do that we just listed uh one of them fasting right reducing the amount of calories coming in why does that release toxins from storage because it also releases nutrients from storage right your body's like right not enough calories coming in not enough nutrients coming in not enough amino acids not enough fats not enough carbs no problem i've got a backup right so it goes into the backup now when it goes up to the backup of sugar carbohydrate in the form of glycogen in your muscles and in your liver in the muscles the glycogen in the muscles that's probably not going to release much toxicity not no big deal the glycogen in the liver could stir some toxicity up we'll talk about that uh, maybe later but here's the issue it's also going to be breaking down amino acids so that's breaking down uh proteins that really most of your muscular tissue which is most of your tissue like you've got some bone you've got some fat but unless you are extremely obese the majority of you is uh protein and if you are let's just say optimal weight then the vast majority of you is protein so it's going to start breaking that down to get the amino acids that it needs depending on where the tissue is that may release some toxicity in terms of the muscles inside like you know for instance your legs and stuff like that there probably isn't a huge amount of toxicity being stored there but in terms of the muscles or uh you know because your your liver is a muscle your kidneys are a muscle your heart is a muscle the uh, biopsies and autopsies very clearly show that although those are not supposed to be toxin storage areas they still have a lot higher toxins than say um you know your biceps or your your quadriceps or whatever it might be so by breaking down those proteins some more toxins are going to go out of storage but it gets worse now so first of all for fuel it will try and use the the sugar ideally often it also uses the amino acids annoyingly which is why people find that when they try and lose weight by you know cleansing and fasting and stuff like that it doesn't work very well because the body's just breaking down the muscle <laughs> rather than <laughs> but anyway sooner or later eventually it will also break down the fat and when i say sooner or later eventually we can be fairly specific about this we can say like within a day or two it's gonna start breaking down significantly the fat and it's gonna release these free fatty acids into the bloodstream 
um, to convert into energy. Now, if you have consumed a lot of omega-6 fats especially, this could be very easily and accurately seen as a type of poison, certainly in the effect that it has on your metabolism. And when it's in storage, it's not great, but it's not doing too much harm if it's, you know, sitting on uh, the, the layer under your skin and your belly or your arms or wherever it might be. But once it's in the bloodstream, it acts in a very toxic way. It will, uh, you know, reduce the level of thyroid, as I just talked about. It will um, uh, support, increase the level of inflammation, um, and it will increase the level of stress chemicals. Stress chemicals go up anyway. I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Stress chemicals go up anyway when you're fasting. I haven't even got to that one yet. <laughs> but let's just go back to the uh, let's go back to the uh, uh, poisons for, that are released for a second. Right now, is omega six the worst thing that is going to be released from those fat cells? Oh no, there are all kinds of other toxins that your body stores in fat. That's the best place it can store it. As I said, sometimes it will store some of it in your um, your organs and stuff and, you know, even muscles and, you know, the, like the tissues. But the that's not good. That's going to impact your health in a very immediate way. Usually the best thing it can do with a toxin, other than get it out, if it's got too much to be able to get out at, at any one time, is to put it into storage in the fat cells. Now, this is especially true for fat-soluble toxins, which tend to be the worst toxins. Generally, the water-soluble, so meaning dissolves in water. The water-soluble toxins, um, although they can be really, really bad, if you just stop taking them in, then your body can clear them out very quickly, generally, except for in the most extreme situations. But the fat-soluble ones are much more problematic. Um, and it's those ones often that are the most poisonous because they're harder for your body to get out. But good news, your body can store them in the fat cells. But then when you start fasting or even just reducing calories, they then start getting released along with these free fatty acids into the bloodstream where they're then poisoning you again. So there are many potential issues with that. Um, and then the other place where your body also stores quite a lot of toxins, um, which will also start getting broken down when there's any prolonged period of fasting or you know, even if it's slight fasting, like a reduced fast or just reducing calories, is in the bones. So the bones carry a lot of toxins. If you Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, specifically heavy metals, famously, right? This is an issue. Everyone these days recommends bone broth and stuff like that. The problem is, unless the animal is super, 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 super clean living, it tends to have high levels of lead, definitely, high levels of cadmium, um, high level of strontium. There's a bunch of different uh, heavy metals which are in significantly high levels. It's really the metals because um, the body, uh, you know, the, the bones con consist mainly of calcium phosphate, ideally calcium and uh, phosphorus. There's also magnesium and boron and silica and a bunch of other stuff, but uh, calcium and phosphorus is the main thing. But um, the body will absolutely also store heavy metals there. And the heavy metals are some of the most toxic things. Most toxins are a question of dosage, as we talked about. Like, it's not that bad unless you have too much of it. But heavy metals are some of the few things like, like lead, uh, like mercury, like uh, cadmium, that there's really no good amount of it. Um, and so, yeah, it stores it in the bones uh, preferentially, especially in the case of lead, because the body can't tell the difference between lead and cadmium. But actually, there's actually a, there's a bunch of minerals, toxic minerals, heavy metals, which all tend to get stored in the uh, bones preferentially. And so your body will start releasing those because of it's releasing calcium. It's releasing calcium partially to buffer the acid toxins, which have got released into the bloodstream. And also, because there's this complex thing around um, uh, stress that the body releases uh, osteocalcin, I think it's called. Um, it's one of the stress signalers. So breaking down the bones and releasing the calcium from the bones is part of the whole stress process as well, which I've not read up on in a while, so don't quiz me on it, Chrissy. We'll do, maybe do another episode <laughs> on that, but I know yeah. it's related. I know that when the body starts to release that calcium from the bones, that can happen either because of detoxification, but also because of stress. Now, 
that leads us to stress, which is the last part, which is when your body does. So when your body's metabolism slows down, if you're able to like just literally lie in bed, maybe, you know, sit up to drink juice or water, you know, get up to go to the toilet, and that's basically it. And if you're able to relax on a mental level and there wasn't anyone demanding anything from you and you've got time off work and all the rest of it, maybe that's okay-ish. But how many people cleanse in that kind of optimized environment? No. Right? Yeah, they're still yeah. out there doing their 10-hour day, do, going to the gym, doing everything and trying to keep up. I was going to say, they have all the demands of life. They have to go to work and all that. But a lot of them even voluntarily go to the gym and all this kind of stuff. And they don't realize, like, if there's not calories coming in, Where's that energy coming from? And it's coming from stress. Now, for some of them, you know, they know that and they think it's beneficial. You know, yes, cortisol and noradrenaline are, you know, anti-inflammatory. And uh, yes, you know, you, you start releasing large amounts of growth hormone if you fast for a certain period, especially if you also exercise and stuff like that. So I know there's various kind of reasons that people do it for, but they, what they're missing, I believe, is that they're suppressing the thyroid and the metabolism by doing that, and they are increasing the level of adrenal chemicals to dangerous levels. Not dangerous as in life-threatening, but dangerous as in very counterproductive to the goal of health, which is what obviously the whole point of uh, a cleanse or a detox is, <laughs> is meant to be. As, I mean, it can be life-threatening, don't get me wrong, but it, you know, it usually isn't. Um, why do people do that? I believe it's... <sighs> justifying the high so adrenaline feels good if the alternative is depression or boredom or whatever uh it feels great in fact compared to those things it doesn't feel good compared to you know peaceful joyfulness but it feels better compared to how most people feel on an everyday level um and then also when your body's in that emergency state because of low calories and all the rest of it it releases endocannabinoids especially if you exercise it releases endorphins, especially if you exercise. So you can actually get really high. You can feel really good of fasting, especially if you're exercising and pushing yourself as well. And you see that in some people like, I never felt better that, you know, in my life than when I you know, juice fasted for a week or whatever. And I think it's less about getting those toxins out, although that will be going on to some degree. And it's more about um, riding the high of these emergency chemicals, right? Why is your body doing this? Why is it releasing more dopamine, which is the feel-good chemical? Why is it releasing? Because dopamine is your um, desire neurotransmitter, and it's it it's dopamine that makes you seek food. It's giving you the thing you need to go and get food. Why is it giving you high levels of endorphins and uh, endocannabinoids? Because it's painful to be hungry and so it suppresses if you are like you know again in the wild in nature starving is it beneficial to be in so much pain that you can't focus no you, then that means you're never going to find any food right so what do they do they increase the adrenaline and the dopamine to give you the energy and motivation to go and get food and then increase the endocannabinoids and uh, uh, endorphins to suppress the pain so that you feel good so that you feel um so that's bearable to go and uh, uh, find food. So that's the wonderfully clever system that nature has created to support you in those emergency situations. And from my point of view, people, including me in the past, without realizing they abuse that um, in order to to get high, which I, is better than taking you know meth or whatever. But it's again, it's not really a health practice no, to and, me. And no, definitely, because as you said, it's counterproductive. And also, sometimes you know people just don't have the knowledge behind it, and they think, oh yeah, I feel amazing, but they don't understand why. They don't understand the, what the actual mechanisms that are going on, and that it's actually more detrimental. And they're lied to. And this is why I've spent so long on this particular topic, because I know you've been lied to about this, you watching, I know you know this, Chrissy, um, by gurus who say, oh, the reason that you feel better is because you're getting toxins out and or because you're giving the digestive system a break. Now, both of those things may be true, that you may be getting toxins out, although the phrase is maybe, and I'll explain that next. Um, and uh, you may, well, you are giving your digestive system some degree of a break, that is true. But that's not, like, what's the feel-good chemical for giving your body a break? You know, that's that doesn't exist. Like, um, 
I mean, okay, if I were to steel man that argument, I would say probably the way that it's most true is, especially if you're fasting, you're not feeding chronic infections that a lot of people have in their digestive tract. And so if you're not feeding them, often they will create less histamine, noradrenaline, serotonin, things that make you feel bad. And so that's maybe where there's some truth to the argument. But you're really swapping one kind of stress for another. That's probably the best case scenario. So maybe your your um, the organisms in you are creating less neurochemicals that are making you feel stressed, but you're running on a different kind of stress. And the proof of this is that people get addicted to it. It's like people get addicted to fasting, but of course the extreme of it are eating disorders uh, where people... Uh, you know, do it to the point that it is actually life-threatening. They don't eat to the, uh, to the point that it is life-threatening. And yes, I understand that there's psychological, you know, reasons for that that I won't go into. But on a practical level, as anyone who's done cleansing and detoxes knows, that there's also just the question of it feels good <laughs> beyond a certain point. I mean, generally, you know, as they say, like the first one to, to two days of fasting, you don't feel good. You feel hungry and crabby and your blood sugar and all the rest of it. But usually what they say is true by about day three, all that goes away, but they miss out why that goes away. That goes away because your body's accepted that this is kind of an emergency now and it's trying to pump you up to be able to actually address it and deal with it. Or it does the opposite. It puts you into a state of shutdown. Um, so that's either the uh, sympathetic state or the dorsal vagal state. So the sympathetic state is the pumped up, the endorphins, adrenaline. But the shutdown state is more like, yeah, endocannabinoids, endorphins, serotonin. And that's where, and maybe that's preferential. So if you're, let's, you know, I said if you're depressed and feeling adrenalized feels good, but there's the other side of that. If you're anxious all the time, then feeling like you're floating around in a fluffy cloud also feels pretty good. And that's what it can feel like to be in that kind of shut down dorsal vagal state after a few days of not eating, like, um, sometimes for some people, all of that kind of anxiety and worry and all the rest of it goes away. And again, that's not necessarily for positive reasons. That's because the body's gone into this kind of shut down emergency state. Yeah, there's these sirens going off. Hey, we, we don't know what she's doing, but we got to figure it out. Come on, rally the troops. <laughs> Well, it's either rally the troops or um, shut her down, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, because that's the other thing. Like, the body can decide, all right, there must not be any food around. Let's just go into hibernation mode. Maybe that's a better way of explaining it. Uh, most people probably haven't watched the episode where we talk about dorsal vagal, but let's just say hibernation mode, right? Now, what does the hibernation mode do? It means that the metabolism is slowing down even more. And so any hope that you had that this cleanse or fast or whatever is going to make you lose weight, forget it. Because all you're doing is slowing your metabolism. And then when you start eating again, which you will, unless you do have that, you know, one of those eating disorders, you will eat again and you'll probably eat a lot. And it probably won't be what you consider healthy food because you're going to be desperate for carbs. So you're probably going to go for something sugary or, you know, high glycemic. Those cravings. Uh, you're going to be desperate for fat and you're probably not going to go for the best form of that. And... You're just going to eat kind of indiscriminately. Probably most people don't break a fast well, despite all the gurus telling them to. And uh, and then when you take all those calories in again, your metabolism doesn't automatically upregulate in most cases. And so you're uh, actually more likely to gain weight after those kind of activities. I realize that's not the only reason why people do it, I'm, but I'm just saying a lot of people at least have that in mind. It would be nice if I could lose a couple of pounds yeah, as well. Yeah, I mean, sometimes people do do these cleanses and detoxes per purely for weight loss purposes. Yeah, yeah. And, if they, and it may help work temporarily, right? Because you lose a lot of water weight as well. You're losing a lot of muscle weight, um, but it will generally not work long term for most people now again all of this is to explain why it doesn't work which it doesn't for most people if you're one of the few people it does work for you know the all the factors weighed up it's overall benefits you then great i'm not arguing with that um i you know there are obviously real benefits but i'm just explaining why often it is detrimental in various different ways okay well it's really great to un to you know, unpack it, as I say, look at those parts, because there will be people, like, oh, yeah, I tried it, didn't work, or felt like this, da, 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 da. So now there's the basis of understanding of, oh, why? Okay. And if that is the case, is there a way to do it better? Can I start to do it correctly so that I can actually get the health benefit that I was hoping to get the first time? 
Yeah, so, okay. So thank you for putting that all out there. So then what actually is involved in detoxification properly and correctly? <laughs> it's a good question. Okay. So there's kind of three phases to the detoxification process, I would say. Uh, two or three. So the first phase, and we talked about this already, toxins being in storage, right? I won't repeat all that again. So the first phase, this is not the order we want to do it in, but this is the order that it occurs in, is from storage into circulation. So storage, as we talked about, could be stored anywhere, but mainly we're talking about the organs, we're talking about the fat cells, and we're talking about the bones. If we have a backlog there, that is undermining the um, optimal functioning of our body. And yes, it is true that it would be better not to have that. Certainly in the case of the organs, that's pretty obvious. If we have a bunch of toxins um, saturating the organs of our body, like our liver or our heart or our thymus or our brain, <laughs> you know, that's not a good thing. Well, yeah, so getting those out. Brain fog is a massive thing out there. So, you know, yeah, getting those out would be, you know, very, very positive. So I'd say brain fog is more related to like what's in circulation, which we'll get to in a second. But general brain not functioning optimally, you know, that eventually leads to Alzheimer's or right. for now is, you know, memory issues, focus issues, mood issues, depression, all that kind of stuff is more what I put in the category of toxins being stuck in the brain. And that's less controversial these days. We used to think that mood issues, for instance, were down to neurotransmitter imbalances. I think there's still some value in that perspective, to be honest, because it's true that by altering neurotransmitters, especially via hormones, you can make someone feel a lot better. But generally, what we're realizing these days is inflammation in the brain. That is more likely to be the issue. Now, what causes inflammation? Inflammation could be uh, caused by an infection, but brain infections are not super common. So why have you got brain inflammation? Um, well, it's probably going to be either a poison or something that your body thinks is a poison, which we call like an allergy, right? So there are apps, even though there's this blood-brain barrier that is your body's attempt to stop poisons getting into the brain, poisons absolutely do go to the brain. And, you know, a famous one that we talked about before, for instance, is uh, mercury, right? Especially certain forms of mercury. They go to the brain, they poison you, they literally drive you insane if they build up enough. And this used to be common, when mercury is used a bit more freely, it's still common-ish now, even when mercury is uh, strictly controlled. Especially, you know, we put mercury in the teeth, which is not a million miles away from the brain. But anyway, so, um, so yes, we don't want toxins in the organs. We don't really want toxins anywhere. So we do want it to go out of storage into circulation. But, but, but. So how does that... Oh, that's, that's explain how that happens. So... You know, so we have all these cells making up all, all these different things. And then there is the circulatory system, which is for kind of transporting nutrients in um, and then waste products out. But there's also the lymphatic system, which is like the body's uh, sewage system is the best way to describe it. And so while some of the waste goes out via the, the vein part of the circulatory system, most of it should be going out through the lymphatic system. And when you start releasing um, toxins from storage in various areas, it will be in those two places. That's where it will end up first. It will end up in the lymphatic system and it will end up in the circulatory system. Now, if it ends up in the lymphatic system, that's fine so long as the lymphatic system isn't overloaded and clogged. Just like a sewage system it absolutely can get backed up. I was going to say, yeah, How and how would we, one, how do we know it's backed up, and two, how do we keep it moving well so it doesn't get backed up? Yeah, so the um, the most obvious way that we can tell that that lymph uh, sewage system is backed up is through swollen lymph nodes, right? This is kind of famous. Um, the, the, you know, various different places throughout the body, and um, you can get that investigated by like a, a massage therapist who specializes in deep tissue massages and stuff like that. They can tell you if you have uh, swollen lymph nodes anywhere and they can help it to move to some degree as well. Um, why does it get backed up there? Either because there's just too much toxicity, but actually it's less that and it's more dehydration, but especially lack of movement. And that lack of movement is you moving your body, but also you breathing properly. 
And so people who breathe in this constricted way from the chest, um, they're not activating this pump. So there's this pump um, from the, uh, the the abdominal region around the navel. Um, specifically, if you're breathing from that place, there's a lymph node right around there, a big one right around that navel that kind of pumps the whole system. It's not quite as obvious as the heart pumping the whole system, the circulatory system, but it's not a million miles away either. And so this doesn't necessarily mean deep breathing. We've talked about that in a different episode, but breathing from that area where your belly goes in when you breathe in and your belly goes back down when you breathe out. So inflate, deflate, inflate, deflate, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. So when that is not going on, when we're doing it, like when our shoulders are going up, when we breathe in, our chest is going out when we breathe in, that means the lymph isn't moving. And yeah, also just moving, you know, we're designed to be walking something like four to six hours a day to have, you know, strenuous activity at least every now and then, you know, running, climbing, throwing, pulling, all of that kind of stuff. And when we're not doing any of that, um, or maybe we are, we're going to the gym half an hour a day, but otherwise we're not walking, we're sitting down all day and all the rest of it. That's still not enough movement. That's still not natural. And I've given advice before on different episodes about that, but I would say be standing and walking around whenever you can. That's, you know, a simple uh, piece of advice that, you know, if you work in an office, fine. As soon as you have to take a call, you know, put it on hands-free, get on headphones and walk around rather than sitting down. You know, if you abs if you can, stand up and walk around. If you, you know, if it's a choice of driving or walking, if you, if you, if you can do it, then walk instead of driving. All of that kind of stuff, right? Walk whenever possible. Anyway, so there's a limp system. But to answer your original question, how can you tell other than going to see a practitioner and maybe have them point out that your lymph glands are overloaded? The, uh, the answer is once that lymph system is overloaded, it will backwash into the blood. And so it's really dependent on how you feel. So how you feel is like the contents of your fat cells makes almost no difference to how you feel. The contents of your liver makes very little difference to how you feel in and of itself. The contents of your bones makes no difference to how you feel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what does make a difference to how you feel is what's in your blood right now. And so this is pretty obvious, right? If we inject you with a drug, um, it will make you feel something the moment it hits your bloodstream, right? That's pretty simple. If you consume something, a pill, it will make a difference only when and if it hits your bloodstream, right? Once it hits your bloodstream, then it, that's when it has the profound effect on you. So what is in your bloodstream is how you feel. That's the really, really important thing to understand. And so in order to go on to the next phase of detoxification, because so far all we've talked about is storage and removal from storage, the next phase after storage is processing. And then I'll just give you the game away now and then I'll talk about it in detail. And then the last phase after that is actually removal or release. So it's remove from storage, process, remove from body. Those are the three phases from the most zoomed out level. And sometimes, of course, there's no removal from storage. Let's just take it in. Put it away. Have it. Go, <laughs> have it well, or I'm thinking of detox. It's take it in, process it. Remove it. Right, That's right. the other for the water soluble things, things like that potentially, and even fat soluble as long as you're not overloaded. Right. But yes. Right. Right. Often right. Water, okay. Water so yeah. Exactly. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. 
To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. So in order to get from um, st storage to processing, it has to go, as I said, either through the lymph, but often that gets blocked and overloaded, or the other one is the blood. And the blood is actually the most direct way because the liver and the kidneys are constantly... Uh, kidneys are more filtering blood. Liver is also filtering, but more kind of doing a much bigger job than just filtering, also processing and, and ch doing a million different chemical reactions, turning one thing into another, controlling the level of this, controlling the level of that. It's doing a lot of stuff. Um, but for the point of view of detoxification for right now, let's just think of them as both processing that toxicity. So before we talk about that, let's just talk about what releases toxins from storage. So, because here is where it gets tricky. And this is where people often feel worse when they try and be healthy. And this is the biggest sad thing. The thing that makes me sad in the health world, honestly, is it's not people who, you know, uh, say they want to be healthy and then do things that they know aren't and then feel sorry for themselves. It's like, we've all done that, but that's your own responsibility, right? That's your choice. That's There we go. But the people who try, <laughs> right, they do everything they're supposed to. They follow the guru's advice. They eat what they're supposed to. They do the cleanse. They do the whatever. And then they feel worse, right? Um, why is that? And not just do the cleanse. When they exercise, I'm about to give you a list. So here is a list of a few different things, certainly not exhaustive, which release... Toxins from storage. Yeah, thank you. Toxins from storage. Number one, fasting. We just talked about that. Number two, reducing significantly the intake of calories. Number three, reducing fat. So even if, if you eat, a, it is true that if you have like a, a diet of, you know, 15% of calories coming from protein, 75 from carbohydrate, 10 from fat, you can survive just fine on that. And there are some people who push that diet as the best diet and the healthiest diet and all the rest of it. Obviously not the keto people, but the ones on the other side. But the thing is, even if that's good for you and the blood sugars are right and everything and all the rest of it, that is a diet that will cause more toxins to be released from storage. Less fat, more toxins released from storage. That's just the way it is. Other things. Sunlight will start the process of removing toxins from storage. Red light. So people do red light therapy, stuff like that. That will significantly, if you're doing like the amount that people do with red light therapy, will remove toxins from storage. Exercise. I just spent a few minutes talking about how good it is. It will absolutely remove toxins from storage. Yes, it will help the lymph flow, which will maybe make things better, but it will also increase the level of uh, toxins going out from storage as well for various different reasons, but one of them being the one we talked about earlier, which is when you exercise, suddenly your body needs lots of nutrients very quickly, and so it starts breaking stuff down, breaking down muscles, breaking down fats to, to release more fuel into the system. Um, heat will release toxins from storage. Now, heat, um, if it causes you to sweat, will also release toxins from your body. So it'll do the last step of actually transporting toxins out. But nonetheless, whether you're sweating or not, especially if you're not sweating, all it's doing is releasing it from storage, but not from the body, if you're not sweating. Um, vitamin B3, uh, especially if it's high levels that some people take, but even you know, the levels found in some foods, the more vitamin B3 you have, especially the active form, the nicotinic acid, um, which gives you the flush feeling if you have uh, too much of it, that releases it from storage, uh, big star. Cold, just talked about heat. Cold, significant levels of cold will also uh, release it from storage. Um, intense breathing, so hyperventilation specifically, will release it from storage, as will breath holding will release it from storage. So when I say intense breathing, hyperventilation, um, you know, like a fire breath from yoga, you know, that kind of thing, but also not breathing. <laughs> that will do it as well. Any kind of breathing that is a combination of the two, like Wim Hof method, but like loads of other traditional yogic and other types of breath, breathing practices as well. 
um, will release toxins from storage. Um, meditation has been found to release toxins from storage to some degree. What do all those things have in common that I just listed, Chrissy? Do you notice anything there? Not in where you're going to go. <laughs> They're all things that are good for well, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. There's, I didn't They're see all McDonald's that are recommended. on the list. No. <laughs> <laughs> McDonald's will not release toxins from storage. Uh, nor will drinking alcohol. Nor will smoking cigarettes. Nor will doing cocaine. Um, you know, all, all of the kind of things that are considered, uh, nor will, you know, a high fat diet. These are all healthy habits and, and great lifestyle things to have and support and, you know, have in a daily practice. Yeah. And so you can see where some, some of the problem comes in, right? If a person is already overloaded and backed up, especially in their processing centers and in their excreting centers, or let's say releasing, because it's less of a gross word, if they're already backed up in the processing and releasing areas, and then they're doing activities that cause more toxins to be released from storage, where are they going to go? If the livers, if the lymph is already overloaded, as it usually is, then it's going to go into the bloodstream. When it goes to the bloodstream, it's going to put more strain on the liver. It's going to put more of a strain on the kidneys. And where, again, remember, wherever's in the blood is how you feel especially because it affects the nervous system and it goes to the brain. Yes, there is that blood-brain barrier, but it definitely doesn't keep everything out. So it will get basically a lot of it, that toxicity will go to the brain and you will feel terrible. So it goes back to your brain fog comment earlier. So I think this is more of a common cause of brain fog is the level right now of toxicity. Circulating, in the blood. right. Circulating. Could be other things, could be a lack of nutrients, you know, like low blood sugar or whatever, but... Uh, if we're talking about detoxing, then yeah, I believe usually it's this um, excess of toxicity in circulation. So this is one of the challenges of, and everything I just listed is either recommended in general for health or often it's recommended as part of a cleanse or a detox. Remember? Yes. Because not everyone only teaches about diet, right? A lot of them say, oh, you should do yoga, which is a form of, you know, both exercise. You should do hot yoga which is and heat, or you should do Wim Hof Method, which is cold and intense breathing. Or, you know... Hot and um, cold plunges, things like that, yeah. You should go in the sun. All of these are good advice, and yet all of them can make you feel worse in the moment if you have this situation. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So then let's talk about the next part. So the next part is the processing centers. So the lymph is also a processing center. So the lymph, as well as being the body's sewage system, it's not only the body's sewage system in the sense of it's not only kind of tubes to transport toxicity to processing, it they also do some filtering. And so the, the processing of toxicity. Um, the other processing centers, uh, so your kidneys, they will filter your blood specifically. So the healthier and stronger your kidneys are within limits, they will prevent you feeling bad. As the toxicity goes into the blood, the better that they're able to function, they all get it out again bring it to the bladder where it can then hopefully leave your body relatively painlessly. If it's too much, it may not be so painless. We talked about this recently where we talked about cystitis. If, if the kidneys are overloaded with that toxicity, then they may be weakened, which may cause the, the immune system to be tipped over into being in a more of a inflammatory state. So there may be inflammation there. Or, you know, it also potentially makes the kidneys weaker to an infection, ultimately. But more commonly, um, the issue is more in the bladder and the urethra. So the toxicity, especially if it's uh, acidic, is what I see quite often. Not all acids are bad in general, but when they're excessive in the urinary tract, they seem to potentially cause an issue in, in, ca in many cases. So the acidic toxins may be there, these water-soluble toxins. It's really water-soluble ones that are going to be coming out via the kidneys, usually, unless they've been conjugated and processed by the liver first. Um, and so they can create a situation where the bladder and the urethra is con you know, very uh, uh, inflamed on an ongoing basis, which they then call interstitial cystitis or whatever. That may have originally been caused by an inf you know, infection, a chronic infection or an acute infection, may have been originally caused by toxins, but assuming you've got 
the, to- the, the infection under control, which often happens, the person still has the pain, the discomfort, and all the rest of it, that can often be because the bladder is overloaded with toxins. And then there's the liver, which we had a huge conversation <laughs> about already. Um, so the liver, just like with a lymph, can become congested. We call that cholestasis. And so when that happens, um, millions of things can go wrong, <laughs> probably literally, because um, the liver does a hell of a lot more than only process toxins. Um, it will, it, you know, it's responsible for the balance of the hormones and the neurotransmitters in the body to a large degree, which really determines fundamentally how you feel. Um, but it's also responsible for processing the toxins, and it's also um, has a big part in digestion. So all of those things and others can go wrong when the liver is overloaded, and especially if it's over, if it's also uh, congested as well. So I'm not going to repeat all of that. Uh, do watch our episode on liver and cholestasis to uh, get a breakdown about how to address that. Because even though I, you know, this is the, almost the first time I've mentioned liver in this whole episode, it is a really, really important part of it. It is the thing. The liver is the part that takes all those toxins that every other part of the body can't deal with. It either can put it into storage or it just can't deal with it at all and it can take it and it can perform uh different processes on it to turn it into something that is the body can then excrete so a lot of toxins they're just too toxic to get out um as they are the liver has to process them often has to conjugate them which means has to attach it a lot of what the liver does is take the toxin and attach something else to it so that it's either safe to be removed or so that it's able to be removed and so there's different versions of that. There's sulfation with sulfur, and there's acetylation with an acetyl group, which is like uh, you know vinegar, and there's uh, there's glutathione, and there's superoxide uh, dismutase, and there's methylation. There's loads of things. We talk about all of it in the um, that episode. But there's loads of different processes it does. But the bottom line of all of them is it, get it gets it ready to then be released. And that leads us to the last phase of the process, and that is release. And so... Um, there's two things we can do in the um, to support the release phase. Number one, what we can do is we can um, help to bind. So I just said that the liver does this conjugation thing. One of the main things it does when it comes to detoxifying, it kind of um, helps to support the safe and easy removal of the, the poison. But if we can help that by adding our own binders in various degrees and the most you know um underappreciated and important one is amino acids so there are various really? amino acids yeah absolutely um in fact you know even some of the things i just talked about that the, you know the fancy different words and methylation and the sulfation and the rest of it these are just amino acid based processes um a lot of uh, heavy metals um there's something called uh, metallo protein basically that they're just uh, combinations of amino acids that the body attaches to these super toxic heavy metals to get them out of the body. So amino acids are really, really crucial. But beyond that, that's not normally what we think about when we think of binders. That's more giving the body the raw material to make its own binders. In terms of like a ready-made binder, the most important things are charcoal, which I talk about a lot in the liver episode. Um, charcoal is this fantastic ability to both attract and also safely contain toxins to stop your body from reabsorbing them. And again, we talk about that in a lot more detail in the liver episode. Uh, Clay, which is fairly similar. Most commonly, uh, bentonite clay and zeolite clay are used. Although really, there's lots of different types of clay that are all effective for this to various degrees. And then the last one, and it's a big category, would be different fibers. And so this could be the fibers found in food. Um, All of them, and I should clarify, soluble fibers, as the name implies, soluble, they're like a sponge, they soak up. And so, you know, the main thing that they're soluble for is water. They soak up water. But of course, they also soak up fats, just like, you know, your your sponge that you wash up with, right? It will soak anything up. Um, And obviously, it would also soak up the toxins, the poisons that are in that water or fat to some degree. So fibers definitely do it. And, you know, pectin is uh, one that's quite famously, you know, it's in fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. Um, Beans as well sometimes. 
uh, that's good, that's very beneficial in the detoxification process. There's a product called Modified Citrus Pectin, um, which is shown to be very good for detoxification. They modify it to kind of make it even smaller particle size so they can actually be absorbed through the lining of the small intestine into the bloodstream, so it can actually do some binding within the bloodstream, which most things cannot. Zeolite claims to be able to do the same thing, again, that the particle size gets so small that it can absorb things within the bloodstream. I personally haven't had as much success with that. I don't see top practitioners these days recommending it. I see a lot of alternative people recommending it. I don't know, maybe that's just my bias. Anyway, people like both. Um, charcoal and the other clay, like the bentonite, are more absorbing things within the intestine. Uh, both of those are important. And so... So binders are one category of support for getting those uh, toxins out of the um, out of the body as quickly and harmlessly as possible, and reducing the chance that the body is going to reabsorb the toxin. And the other thing that you can do to support the body actually detoxing, getting the toxins out, is supporting the four main exits of the body. So the four main ex exits of the body are the lungs, the skin, the bladder, and the large intestine. So how do we support each of those? With the lungs, we can support the lungs through making sure, first of all, that the air that we breathe is clean, either through moving to a different location, but I'm a big fan of an air purifier. Um, a good quality air purifier, I think, is a great investment. If you can afford it, and I would encourage it to be quite high on the list of things that you prioritize in terms of health. So many people spend so much on supplements and, uh, you know, cleanses and practitioners and all the rest of it. Um, but especially if you live in an environment that's either urban, so you've got traffic fumes and industry and all the rest of it that are coming in, or moldy. So usually it's either you live in the city, in which case you've got all the city fumes, or you live in the countryside, in which case you've got the mold, <laughs> mycotoxins. Usually you've got one or the other. Um, and then, you know, if, if you've got pets, if you've got whatever. And then we've got to remember, we're breathing out toxins all the time. So no, I don't think carbon dioxide is a toxin, but still there are other gases, um, like, for instance, hydrogen sulfide and, and methane and all the rest of it that we are breathing out to some degree especially if we have chronic infections, that are also toxins. So um, purifying that air is really, really important. There's not a huge amount you can do to support your lungs um, getting toxins out other than breathing from the diaphragm, like we talked about. Um, but ultimately, you shouldn't breathe more. You shouldn't over-breathe. So that is not really going to help getting more toxins out. But it's more about um, reducing the toxins going into the lungs so they can be maximally supported to transporting them out. Next, the skin. There's two main ways, I would say. Oh, well, actually, let's do three. So the first, again... <laughs> yeah, give us one for the bonus. <laughs> <laughs> so the bonus one that didn't immediately occur to me because I never do it, but of course, actually, it's super relevant for most people, is don't clog it. <laughs> don't stop toxins going out. An antiperspirant is literally... It's an anti-detoxifier. And it's a heavy metal, by the way. It's aluminium. And know those crystals that you get from hippie shops that claim to be natural deodorant, they're literally, it's just a lump of, if you look at the ingredients list, it says alum. It's just aluminium or aluminum, I think you guys call it. Like that is blocking the pores. It's a heavy metal that blocks the pores. It is an anti-detox agent. Do not do it. If you really, you know, if it's really an issue of the smell and all that, then um, putting a little bit of baking soda around the area where you sweat and it tends to stink will be as effective as an antiperspirant, but without clogging the pore and preventing the detoxification process. It'll just neutralize it as it comes out. I mean, yeah, it's a powder. It's not great. But, you know, people use talcum, stuff like that. It's not really any different from that. Uh, so don't use antiperspirants. Don't use makeup. Sorry, women. Um, if you do use it, make sure at least it isn't poisonous. So at least if it's blocking the pores, at least it's not blocking them with a poison, which the vast majority of makeups are. With moisturizers, be careful. Moisturizing, great. Pore clogging with toxins, not so great. So look at what it actually is. Look at the fabrics that you're using, you know. 
I see people these days talking about, oh, you know, they've realized polyester isn't a good idea. Well, guess what? Nor is cotton in more, most cases. Uh, yes, it's a natural fabric, but the amount of pesticides used to grow cotton is massive. And no, it's not all washed away before you first put it on your skin. So I'd say if you're going to wear cotton clothes, either have them be secondhand, um, as in they've really been washed and you know rinsed many, 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 many times by someone else, or obviously preferably have them be organic cotton. I personally pretty much exclusively wear hemp, linen, silk. All these shirts I always wear, they're all silk. Um, trousers I wear, always hemp. Like, And do I do this because they look great? Uh, they don't look that great. I, I know you. More it's, yeah, it's ones. more about the function. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it's absolutely possible, obviously, to if you want to prioritize looking a certain way. These days, you can find these natural fabrics and designs and colors and all the rest that you, know, you think look good, that you actually like. But prioritize it otherwise yeah in the case of polyester you're just wearing plastic um imagine what that's doing to your skin taking in those estrogens and all the toxins that they use to process that pl plastic and turn it into a uh, piece of clothing in the first place in the case of cotton it's all the pesticides um some people talk about like the frequency of it being super low i don't know about that but maybe that's another thing like energetically it's not good but yeah, use your and wool. I didn't mention wool, but yeah, wool is another great one. Use your natural, non-soaked in poisons fabrics. Um, what else in the area of skin? Cleaning products. You know, just talked about natural clothes. But then if you go and use like some Tide or whatever, you know, uh, mainstream washing detergent, then you're still going to be saturating your clothes with toxins. You might as well just be wearing polyester. Like, be aware of all this stuff. Realize that toxins go in through the skin. Um, to, to me, this is so obvious. We talked before about the nicotine patches, that, like the, the thing that proves the whole idea that toxins st stuff doesn't go in through the skin false. But I do these bath bombs these days with sodium bicarb and citric acid we talked about. And this is within minutes of doing it, I get like a taste of lemon in my mouth. That's um, from the citric acid. Like I, when I apply something to my skin, uh, you know, it sounds like I can taste it within minutes. If I put like some kind of herbal moisturizer that's healthy or something, I can immediately like taste. Like that's the way it should be. You should actually have that connection to like understanding what you're putting in your skin. Good rule of thumb I've seen some skincare experts teach is if you wouldn't put it in your mouth, don't put it on your skin. I think that's a very, very good rule of thumb yeah, to go that, by. Yeah, that was one of the biggest eye-openers for me when I heard that for the first time and it really landed. And of course, some people, oh, but you know, this makes me look good and all the rest of it. Well, fair enough, right? This is a choice. This is not about being perfect. It's not about beating yourself up, but just realize it's counterproductive to your goal of detoxifying if that's something that you're focused on. And maybe that's okay. Maybe you live with it. Um, so... For the skin, but yes, that was going to be that was my bonus one. Um, <laughs> the main thing for the, you can do for the skin is number one, encourage sweating. Right, there's loads out there. I see it more and more popular these days, and I'm very glad. Saunas, you know, fantastic. Infrared sauna, normal old school saunas, steams. I think steams are great um, because I tend to be dry, so I like the um, the moisturising aspect of it for the lungs and all the rest of it and the sinuses. But there's one caveat, if the water is toxic, <laughs> which it almost always is. Um, in terms of toxicity of water, I mean, yeah, we're going to get to that next when we talk about bladder. Um, so I'll, I'll cover it now. Water filter. I just said air filter, water filter. Someone who's dedicated to health, someone who wants to detoxify, invest in a water filter. Um, we, we have two at this the house that we own. And I realize if you're renting, like we were before, it's trickier. Um, but getting a, uh, I have something called a water purifier for drinking water. I can't remember the company's name, but we can put a link, Chrissy. Um, they're available in the US and the UK and probably other places. And so they provide like one of those little taps off your main tap for you to get drinking water from. But there, they purify water so well that it's more pure than distilled water. Wow. They remove literally almost everything. It's not super cheap, but to have the you know very very purest water and then what i normally do is add a little bit of minerals back in i add um for for like a gallon i put in uh i don't even know it's like what the you know those little spoons the yeah. uh, the dash the dash size is like yeah like dash smidgen da smidgen yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 
Whatever the smallest one of those is, and I put a what, pinch, half maybe. of one. Uh, no, that's probably bigger. <laughs> no, it probably was pinch. Maybe like half a pinch of sodium bicarb and then like a pinch of magnesium chloride because that gives me all the minerals that are naturally in water that I would want to be in water. So basically it's all of them except calcium. Calcium dries water and also, um, you know, uh, put scale on your kettle and everywhere that you use it so I don't add calcium because uh, I get plenty from my food. But yeah, so put... Get the absolute purest water and then put minerals, a couple of minerals back in. I mean, that's not too hard for me. Just a little scoop of this, a little scoop of that per gallon, done. Um, so, yeah, the purest water. Anyway, so that's one type of filter, but we do have a whole house filter as well, which is not as pure as a purifier, but we're lucky that the water is pretty clean here anyway. So just a general filter gets it down to a level that I'm happy with. Going Because we're talking about the skin still here. The skin um, absolutely absorbs a lot from a shower, uh, like chlorine, and but also fluoride, and it, but all of it, mercury, aluminum, everything that would naturally be in the water if the water is not purified in many locations. It can absolutely go in through the skin very, very easily, arguably easier than actually drinking it. Because if you're drinking it, there's all these screens in the way, uh, like the liver and the kidney that, will hopefully prevent it from you know getting to the brain and stuff but if you're taking it in through the skin uh goes straight to the bloodstream um and can overload your system very very easily so purify your whole house water if you possibly can um so yeah that was talking about steam uh hot bath even is absolutely fine honestly even though i have an infrared sauna hot bath is what i tend to do because i like to do um Put some minerals in there. Just talked about that. Some sodium bicarbonate, and citric acid to get some CO2 going as well. Um, but yeah, something hot. To sweat every day to me is like a no, non-negotiable part of health. And um, exercising also does that. So I like to sweat while relaxing and I like to sweat while exercising. I've seen conflicting studies about uh, which of those is more effective. Some people say that the exercise, like sweating while exercising half an hour is more effective than sweating while, you know, lying in the sauna for half an hour because you're moving the lymph as well. Right. Now, that is a very good point. But my counter to that would be, yes, but when you're exercising, you're stimulating a lot of stress chemicals. And generally, stimulating stress chemicals reduces the amount of toxins going through storage because your body prioritizes immediate survival over processing a backlog of toxins. So... I'm not 100% sure who's right, so I do both. <laughs> and I'd recommend you do both. Sweat while exercising, you know, at least, what, three or four days a week, ideally. If you're well enough to do that, if you're not, then don't. Just do the relaxed version. Yeah, because I was going to say, I mean, not not everybody, well, di different types of exercise out there, and that's not necessarily recommended as an everyday thing. But if you do want to sweat every day, then, you know, those relaxing you know, saunas especially, I do find those very helpful, especially right before bed at night. It just calms my system down and I tend to drift off very well. Yeah, just to clarify that, you're absolutely right. I don't mean buckets of sweat, especially if someone's starting their health journey. But, you know, even walking, if you're not used to walking, if you do it for 20 minutes, half an hour, you'll get a bit of a sweat on. And I guess that's what I mean. Yeah. You know, like whatever is reasonable level of exertion for you that makes you sweat a little bit will still help to get those toxins out. And then do wash it off afterwards. That's the other thing. If you leave it to sit on there, because the skin is so absorbent, it will absorb some of it back again. Um, and the other thing that you can do for the skin, beyond just encouraging your body to push, so there's push, but then there's also catch, or maybe even draw. And so um, the the uh, mud bath, the uh, wearing a poultice of clay, doing... Um, I don't know what they called when women put those uh, face masks on, Chrissy. The um... there's different types, yeah, yeah, just a face mask or like a cleansing purifying mask. There you have charcoal ones, they have clay ones, things like that. Okay, so yeah, any of those, all of those, anything that's drawing stuff out, anything that claims to clean your pores, but by process of applying something that draws out, probably. I mean, check the ingredients, but that's the kind of stuff we're talking about, and that can be combined with what I said previously as well. So. You can put on clay, you know, just mix clay and water, put it on whatever, whatever area of your body you want to reduce the toxins. You can put it around your liver, you can put it on your face, you can put it on your feet, you can put it wherever, um, and then get it into a sauna. 
um, or even get into a bath afterwards. Yes, it will wash it off, but that's okay. The clay will still be in the water and it will still be drawing to some degree. Um, so yeah, actually pulling the toxins out via the skin would be another strategy. Uh, clay and charcoal can be drying on the skin, so make sure to moisturize afterwards if you need to. And then lastly, in terms of exits, no, no, second to last, uh, we've got the bladder. Um, and so how do you support toxins going out for your bladder? Uh, very simple, this one. Adequate level of fluids going in. So the bladder is largely about flushing in most cases. So the biggest mistake people get into with the bladder and often one of the causes of initial at least of cystitis and stuff like that is just dehydration. Yes, it is possible to overdo it with water um, or overdo it with drinking liquids. You can overhydrate. There is a way of testing this, by the way. Um, if you get the little test strips the where they give you like 10 values that are commonly used by hospitals, but you can get like 100 strips off Amazon for like less than $10. There's a bunch of different things in there. It'll tell you blood sugar and is the urine in your blood and stuff like that. But one of the ones I never knew what it meant before is called specific gravity. Do you ever see that, Chrissy? No, no, I haven't. Okay, so specific gravity uh, tells you how hydrated or overhydrated are you, and so it's it's kind of it's basically telling you what level of kind of minerals and stuff are in your urine. If your urine is too dilute, then that's also not a good thing. That can um, lead to various other issues due to a, a lack of mineralization. So some people hear all that and then they're like, oh, they're afraid to drink too much water. Some people do the opposite. So I say rather than guessing, you can either base it on how you feel, but if you don't trust how you feel because how you feel has been all messed up by drugs and stress and all the rest of it, then you can get these test strips, as I say, they're kind of available everywhere very easily. And uh, they're a good thing to check every now and then anyway. You know, I'll tell you the level of all kinds of things going on in your urine. But yeah, one of them is specific gravity. Uh, just make sure it's kind of not uh, much more than like the middle on the scale. It should be not a um, very dark color. I believe that's the way right, right, it is. Right. But, so kind of more yeah. in the middle of what's there. Yeah, yeah. If it's uh, And obviously, that's to test that you're not overhydrated. The other way is pretty easy. If your urine is dark or, or you need like more. yellow, <laughs> need some more orange, water. <laughs> if it stinks, etc., then that's obviously uh, more water. Uh, minerals as well, we just talked about that, can support that whole process, can support the bladder, especially alkaline minerals. Some people do well. I talked about having a tiny little bit of sodium bicarbonate in my water, but you can do a little bit more if, if you need that um, alkalizing, but be careful not to overdo it because as we talked about recently in the uh, digestive infections episode if you have if you're taking a lot of alkaline it can mess up your digestive tract but if you're talking about you know putting two pinches per gallon or something that's not going to mess up your digestive tract but it does alkalize your water enough that it may you know support um, uh, a little bit more of a soothing effect on your bladder potentially and then the other thing you can do to support bladder health and kind of traditional thing in um the kind of naturopath world would be um, diuretics. So various different herbs that support the excretion of liquid. So basically it's kind of fast tracking the removal of toxins via the removal of liquid. If you use those, make sure you get plenty of fluids and minerals are with it on the other end. And so these are herbs like dandelion, this famous dandelion leaf and root. Um, Ufa Ursi, Cranberry, Juniper, Goldenrod. Um, yes, yeah, I'll remember off the top of my head, but there's a bunch, you know, just general kidney cleansing herbs. They would be in that category. Um, and they are what they have in common is they all have that diuretic effect. So I have a quick the question. General recommendation, quick question yeah. on dandelion. Um, would it be root and leaf or separate together, or does it matter? Uh, it can be either or both. Um, they, they have a reasonably similar effect, at least when it comes to uh, diuretics. Um, the leaf is supposed to be more supportive of the uh, liver, I believe. Um, but yeah, they're kind of generally used interchangeably. Um, on a practical level, the dandelion root, when it's roasted, it kind of tastes a lot like coffee. So I recommend it to lots of people as a coffee substitute. Um, so you might want to try it for that reason as well. So yeah, diuretics. And then lastly, yeah, the large intestine. And so how do you support that? Well, when it comes to toxins, it's really what we already mentioned, binders. So 
a lot of what the large intestine does is reabsorb water and some minerals as well. And so, and, and if they reach there, which they often don't, but bile acids uh, and, and bile. And we, if you do not want, and, and I just said minerals, but minerals could include lead, mercury, cadmium, all the ones that you don't want to be reabsorbed, right? So if you want to prevent that reabsorption, then binders. Um, and the other thing is laxatives and um, enemas, colonics, that kind of thing. It's probably not something you want to be doing every day or on a regular basis. We've talked about this in the recent episode of chronic infections and the um, digestive tract, but where it can be useful is in this area of detoxification. If you know you are doing a bunch of stuff to release toxins from storage and you know that you're supporting your processing centers for you know to process that as quickly as possible and get it out of the body, then probably the last thing you want is for it to be sitting in there for the a way long, down to yeah. large in, <laughs> well to get all the way there and then either sit there as you say irritating the large intestine creating inflammation in the large intestine or probably even worse getting reabsorbed again going back to the liver and back into the bloodstream where it can make you feel bad again so i'd say those are the cases where a laxative is probably the most permissible the type that I would recommend the most is just magnesium rather than any kind of drug-based one or honestly even any herbal-based one. The problem with all the herbal-based ones is they all have a bunch of other effects and if you know that those other effects are desirable to you, probably because a practitioner has recommended them to you who understands you, then great. But if you are not sure, you know, if we're talking about um, cascara or rhubarb brew or the bitter part of aloe or all that kind of thing, they can all be great. I'm not saying they're not, but if you don't fully understand the effect they're having on you, it's probably better to just go for um, like magnesium. And uh, these days I've gone back and forth on this a little bit, but I think magnesium oxide, a lot of people say that it's not good. It's not well absorbed, but that's the whole point. It is just It just goes straight through you and causes that release. The other one would be magnesium chloride. I prefer oxide these days because chloride has this kind of drying effect. It's the, um, you know, salt is drying, but it's the chlor chloride part of so um, salt, not the sodium part of salt. So magnesium chloride is the same thing. Uh, but if you're not worried about that drying effect, magnesium chloride also works very well for that, um, for that laxative effect. So obviously not necessary if you're going frequently already, but a lot of people who have various type of health issues. They're not going as frequently as you would ideally want if you're actively trying to detoxify. And I say it that way because there's a lot of disagreement about that. Maybe it's fine to have a bowel movement three times a week if you're in a state of optimal health or whatever. I don't know. It depends <laughs> on your diet and a lot of other factors. But the point is, if you're actively trying to fast track the removal of toxins from your body, then having a bowel movement a couple of times a week is going against that goal, right? It's slowing that whole process down. You may well be reabsorbing those toxins again. So to support it by, uh, as I said, binding the toxins, but also speeding up the process of them being removed can be very, very appropriate. Wow. Okay. So thank you for answering that question. <laughs> what does it really Took entail? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and so just to finish that off. So here's the most important conclusion from this. Everyone does this the wrong way around. They start with activities, whether it's fasting or exercise or whatever, that re remove toxins from storage when the processing centers are probably already overloaded and the exits are probably already overloaded and or blocked. So I recommend doing it the opposite way around from how most people do it. And I recommend it also doing it the opposite way around from what I just said. So first of all, all the advice I just gave at the end there about supporting the removal from your body, do all of that first. Get all of that in place first. Make sure you're having regular bowel movements or support that process. Sweat on a very regularly, preferably daily or more common basis, right? Make sure that there's enough... Um, uh, make sure that you're hydrated and, and mineralized adequately to support the, the bladder's release of uh, toxins. 
Make sure that you're supporting the skin's release of toxins. Make sure you're supporting the lungs' release of toxins and not giving the lungs more toxins. Do all that first. Then think about the processing centers. What can I do to support my kidneys? What can I do to support my liver? Again, that's a whole separate episode that we already did. What can I do to support my lymph? Then, when all of that is in place, then, and only then, are you ready to intentionally release toxins from storage. And if you do it that way, you won't have any of the suffering, the side effects, the Herxheimer's reaction, the cleansing reaction, whatever they call it, all of that kind of stuff. You will either not have it or you'll have it way less because when they say oh it's a cleansing reaction it's a good sign it means that you're healing it's kind of true but what they really mean if they understood it better is it's a sign that you've released too many toxins from storage your processing centers are overloaded your removal your four removal channels are blocked or not able to keep up with it and so it's backwashing into your blood where it's affecting your brain making you feel like crap that's what's yeah, really going That's why on. you feel like rubbish, so go lay down. <laughs> <laughs> and that's also, too, why people then are like, no, I'm done. I'm not going to do it, which can then be hindering their health further on. And just then they're just continuing to, to bring in more and more toxins. Well, then they, you know, used the example earlier. I knew someone who famously did this. He'd go from fasting to literally eating McDonald's and he would feel so much better. And I might have laughed at him at the time, I can't remember. But if I did, I was wrong. Because actually, he was right. He was right. As much as that's not the ideal medicine, it would have completely shut down the whole toxin release from storage process. Um, it would have given him some calories, which he probably desperately needed, some protein, which he desperately needed, some fat, even though it's not good, which he probably uh, you know, really reduced the, um, the rate of uh, uh, toxin removal from the cells. And it made him feel better. And it makes sense. And so if you've been that person, whether it's McDonald's, whether it's pizza, whether it's cookies, whether it's ice cream, whatever, don't beat yourself up. You're not weak-willed. You're not whatever. Actually, probably that was a not optimal maybe, but a perfectly legitimate strategy for dealing with how you felt in your body. And so let go of any guilt or, or self-flagellation uh, based on that behavior. Realize it was like an unconscious attempt to make yourself feel better emotionally, sure, but actually also probably to stop this process going on inside your body that wasn't really doing you any favors. If your liver and kidneys are already overloaded on an everyday basis and then you um, reduce the, um, uh, sorry, yeah, then you increase the toxins being released from storage, you are making things worse, not better, really. Okay. Okay. I'm really glad that you gave that, uh, you know, that most important conclusion because that says a lot. If the doors of the exit are not open, you're just not even going to be, it's just not going to work. It's just not going to work. You've got to get the flow. You've got to unplug the, so that the flow can move freely out, which is your ultimate end result. Okay. Yeah. That makes so much sense. I just want to add in terms of strategy for that. With the bladder, it's got to go for the kidneys first. It's got to go through processing that may well already be, you know, pushing its limits. With the large intestine, it's got to go for the liver and the small intestine first. They may already be overloaded and pushed their limits. But the lungs, as we said, a lot of toxicity is removed through lungs in terms of volume. But there's not a lot you can do really support it going out. And it's usually it's not the worst toxins either going out for the lungs. So that really leaves the skin. The skin really is the best way to push toxicity out possible. And it's funny that in Eastern medicine, they say, you know, people with skin issues, eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis, and all the rest of it, they actually say that that is a sign of relative health and vitality of the person. So they say that the sicker you are, the less able your body is to deal with those toxins and the deeper it tends to go. They say, you know, like the deepest it goes is like, into your heart and your kidneys and and, and your liver. Um, whereas the if it's coming out for the skin, that's the most superficial kind of level of toxicity. 
from their point of view, as in least deep. Yeah, that's a great point. It's a great point because it's going to start on those easy places first of where to put it. And then if those places are full up, then it's going to go the next layer and deeper layer. And then if, once that gets filled up, it's just going get, to keep getting pushed further, deeper, deeper, deeper. And some of the sickest people I've met uh, have really flawless skin. Um, and so it's really weird. I remember, you know, a few of them complaining to me, like, everyone says that I look fine and I just feel like death. And yeah, so that is a sign, again, from this Eastern point of view. I don't know if it's quite understood from a Western perspective, but from this Eastern point of view that you don't have the vitality to push it out through your skin. So anything you can do to support it going out for the skin. That's why I'm such a big fan of uh, detoxification, yes, but also why I spent quite a long time talking about not poisoning your skin with all the different ways that people do these days. The more you can not clog your skin and get toxins out for your skin, because it doesn't require going through any kind of um, processing center. And in some cases, it doesn't even require going through the bloodstream. So toxins can literally go from cell to lymph to skin and out. Not overloading your liver, not overloading your kidneys, not going into your bloodstream sometimes and making you feel bad. That's the optimal. Obviously, you can't get all your toxins out through that way, but the more that you can get out through that way, the better. And even the worst toxins, even your lead, your mercury, your cadmium, even your mycotoxins, even your pesticides, even the very worst toxins, they found them in people's sweat. So you can get the worst toxins out for your skin. And I would say, yes, you can do it too much. You can sweat too much ultimately because unless you're really on top of, you know, replacing the water and the minerals... Um, but certainly make it a daily activity, even if you don't do it eight hours a day, maybe you do it half an hour a day, but make it a daily activity if you need to prioritize and detoxing. Obviously, if you don't, if you're not toxic, then no problem. You know, it, just to address the Eastern system for a second there, certainly the TCM system, Ayurveda is different, but the TCM system is not a fan of sweating. They say, don't do it, generally. Why? Because when that was first formulated, people had an issue where toxins were scared and nutrients were scared. Right. So that Scarce. was, yeah, because otherwise you'd just be sweating that out of your body and you really need it for it. So it's not easy to replace yeah. back right, then, right. right? You couldn't just go to a shop and order some magnesium chloride or whatever it might be. Salt, you know, the reason why salt come, and salary, the word salary comes with salt. Salt used to be so precious. It was like gold, you know, all that kind of stuff. These days, salt is cheap as dirt, right? Magnesium is extremely cheap. So it's a very potassium, chloride, all the rest of it. So it's a very different situation, whereas toxins are everywhere, as we talked about earlier. So it's a different situation now. Yes, you should be aware of the needing to replace minerals as well as water, but as long as you are, I would say, you know, it's a, it's a beneficial thing. So with all this education, let's say, okay, everybody's taken this on board. Then... What would be the best cleanse or detox for an individual? Should they juice? Should they, you know, do a juice cleanse? Should they they fast water fast? Should they or do is doing all these things just allowing the body enough to to um, allow the detox pathway to be open? What you know, what best cleanse or detox should somebody and you know tackle? Okay, that's a good question. So I hope that something that may be becoming clear to people by now is this is not a, a thing that you're going to resolve in a weekend you know this is really an <laughs> no three-day thing going on here <laughs> <laughs> well there can be an addition but you have to put the basics in place first so again supporting those four exits really that's an ongoing basis right everything that i said there making sure that you're not constipated supporting that um making sure you're not dehydrated Yes, detoxifying and not bringing more toxins for the skin, that's an everyday thing. That's not something that you do in a special way. Um, making sure you're not breathing in toxins, again, that's an everyday thing. Talked about air purifier, ideally getting, you know, in a, uh, what's the word, like a positive air environment, like a beach or a forest or something like that on a regular basis as you possibly can. All of those are everyday thing. So that's the, the, the last step in the way I explained it is the first step you focus on. Okay, as you said, let's imagine that you're on top of that. Next, you go backwards. Lymph system is like exercising something that you do over, you know, for a weekend and then you're done. No, it's an ongoing practice, right? 
Um, is breathing for the diaphragm a weekend activity or is it something that you have to keep doing? It's an ongoing practice, right? Um, in terms of the stuff of the liver, which we didn't cover in this episode, all the stuff about cholestasis um, and keeping the liver flowing and supporting the liver, no, that's an ongoing practice. So all of those are ongoing. Now, once you already have those in place, first of all, you're going to be feeling a lot better anyway, first and foremost. And people do. People just start saunering or they just start drinking water or they just start um, you know, uh, uh, using binders or whatever it might be, and they already feel better. So that's the first thing. But So then is there such a thing as a cleanse? That is your question, right? Yeah. Is, is, and, and what's a good one? Well, once you have all that in place, then you might want to go, you know what? I've got a week off here. I've got a weekend spare here. What can I do to fast track the process more? And that's a great question. And that's where you then start to think about your um, agitators. How do I agitate the removal of, of toxins from my cells? And I would say this comes down to some degree on uh, personal preference, right? So do you want to do it by fasting? Do you want to do it by doing, you know, an intense exercise thing, right? Some people go to boot camps and all that kind of thing where they really push themselves physically. Do you want to do it that way? Do you want to go to some yoga retreat thing where you do hours of, you know, stretching and, and breathing practices to get the toxins moving? Maybe that's a thing. Do you want to do like what I call the Scientology cleanse where you take a big dose of vitamin B3 and then sit in a sauna for hours, which... Um, the vitamin B3 really, really strongly encourages the cells to release toxins into the lymph and blood and then the sauna, you know, quickly transports as many of them out as possible. Maybe you want to do it that way. Uh, maybe you're going on holiday and you're planning to be in the sun all day, getting loads of that UV and red light, which helps to start, you know, the cleansing process. And then you go and swim in the sea and you get that fresh sea air, and you get the exercise, and you get the cold of the sea, the contrast of the cold of the sea with the hot of the sun, and the rest of the thing you're doing with the hot cold. Do you see what I mean? Like, it depends on your preference. It depends on your circumstance. It depends on, uh, you know, what you want to do. I would not do all those things simultaneously for the first time, you know? I wouldn't go to a hot place, get hours of sun, do hours of hot yoga, and cold, and uh, when you're not used to any of it, because then you probably will over even though you've done all my advice, you'll probably still overload yourself. You probably still get ill. This is what often happens to people when they detox and they're not ready for it. But, you know, you can start to dip your toe into that stuff. Now, that's the extreme version. The more, the less extreme version is, well, let me try doing 20 minutes of Wim Hof Method once a day or once every other day and see how that goes. Let me start doing 30 minutes of high-intensity exercise training three days a week. Let me start doing, you know, maybe 20 milligrams of vitamin B3 once every other day. And if that is no big deal, upping it to 30 and, you know, like increasing that gradually. Um, let me start, um, let me do a little intermittent fasting where I just skip the evening meal every other day or every day or something. Do you see what I mean? So that's probably the more sensible method of doing it is to dip your toe into any of these um toxin storage agitators and if they make you feel better not worse then you know that your system is keeping up with it now the important thing to do is to remember everything that you've learned in this episode meaning because to begin yeah to begin with if, especially if you do it the way i'm recommending you probably almost certainly will feel better for at least a while and then you'll get more and more confident and cocky if you're anything like me and you'll be like, oh, this is no big deal. And then you'll do more of this and more of this and more of this. And eventually you'll start feeling worse. And at that point, you've got to remember, no, it's not necessarily that the yoga is making me feel worse or the um, you know, breathing practice is making me feel worse or the, uh, uh, the sprinting or the running or the weight training or the fasting, intermittent fasting or the having a juice once juice cleanse once a month or whatever I mean it's not necessarily that those things are in of itself making me feel worse the problem is just that it's too much the amount that i'm doing is too much and it's overloading my processing centers and it's overloading my exit pathways and if you remember that you go back to prioritizing those reduce your agitating activity temporarily 
then you'll be fine. Beautiful. <laughs> great answer. Great answer. Well, this has been highly informative and extremely useful because I was one of those people in the past like, oh, let me do, you know, a three-day water fast. Oh, let me do this or let me do that. And, you know, think me, I'm doing things great. I didn't feel horrible. I didn't feel any of those things. But to be honest, I don't know if I was actually even doing myself any good because, you know, one, was I, you know, slowing down my metabolism? What I, was I putting myself in a worse state before I even began? So this is super helpful. I would say if you weren't feeling bad in any way, you probably were overall, it was net positive. I'd say you're in one of those categories of people where it was a good thing. Yeah, you may have been slowing down your metabolism, but you might have been spiking your stress chemicals a little bit and stuff like that. But if you didn't really feel bad, then you're probably okay. But I'm kind of more pitching this episode at most people, they don't stick with these things. Yeah. Most people, they've tried it and they don't want to do it anymore. Um, and maybe they're like, oh, I should do detox because I'm feeling this and that. And, I'm, and I've been told it's toxins, but I don't really want to because last time I did, I felt terrible. So that's more who this is for. And you are probably more sensible, moderate as well, Chrissy, is what I would guess. Um, I hope you know, so. so maybe, <laughs> ma maybe you did, I don't know, two or three days water fasting, but you didn't do like two weeks, three weeks, like I know some people no. do, you know. So that's the thing. It's, uh, part of it is listening to your body and if your body is reliable. The problem is the kind of most trite advice that I see in the uh, health world that generally doesn't come from the most successful people. The most successful people give very black and white, you do my system and everything will be great kind of advice. But, you know, a lot of people also give a just listen to your body man kind of advice. And that advice is accurate so long is the less healthy your body is, the less accurate and helpful it is. That's the problem. Um, you know, when you're an addict, if you give the person advice, listen to your body, the body will go, give me drugs, yeah. you know? <laughs> so you got to, or, you know, if you're a food addict, give me food. If you're a gambling addict, then, you know, give me another bet, you know, whatever. The point is you can't always trust your body, but if you're relatively healthy, then you relatively can. And so you, Chrissy, you probably never got into such a bad state because, uh, you know, you maybe you tried these things a bit unstrategically, fair enough, but you probably listened to your body enough that you stopped it from ever being uh, like a real problem. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there were some times where I could definitely feel like, oh, wait a minute, uh, you know, and I just take a little salt or do something like, okay, no, I'm done. I'm done. You know, so yeah, I definitely did listen to my body. Um, before we close on this, and, oh, go ahead. And sorry, and, and the other thing, and we may see this when we do a future episode, Chrissy, because I think we've definitely reach time now um you might you know just have better genes for this as well like for whatever reason you know your liver is better and this is better and that is better and and therefore it's less of a risk for you that it would go wrong than for some people wonderful wonderful well any final thoughts owen on, on this episode for our listeners thank you for watching if you disagree with what i've said i am very open to hearing it um and if you think i've missed anything i would love to hear it especially in any of these categories you know oh elwin there's this binder that you didn't mention that's really good or uh whatever i'd love to hear it so yeah yeah please do leave your comments below everyone and again thank you for joining us please make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button so you don't miss any episodes and we'll see you next time hey i hope you enjoyed that video you may have noticed i recommended a few different videos in that episode and one of the ones I'd recommend is just here if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below if you want to click on that one and watch that next.